Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the second talk of the series Mind the Dash, the modern contemporary and the in-between in Indian art. I am Pooja Vesh, the director of the JNF, which is the Jahangir Nicholson Art Foundation. Uh, the JNF has a collection of post-independence Indian art and it is housed in the CSMBS Museum in Mumbai, where it forms the modern and contemporary art wing of the museum. Uh, this series is presented by the JNAF in collaboration with the Peabody Essex Museum. Uh, these talks are a set of conversations over three consecutive Fridays with Dr. Zera Jumabhoy, Dr. Siddharth V. Shah, and myself. Uh, just to give you a little uh, introduction, though we did this in the last session as well, so for some of you that might be a repeat. Um, Siddharth is a UK based, uh, sorry, Zera is a UK based art historian, lecturer and curator specializing in South Asian art. She guest curated the first international institutional exhibition dedicated to the progressive artist group at the Asia Society Museum in New York. Zera has also been a consultant for the recent rehang of the Hurwitz collection at the Peabody Essex Museum. Siddharth is curator of Indian and South Asian art at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, the museum houses the Chester and Davida Hurwitz collection of post-independence art from India. Uh, he has spent the last uh, two years interpreting and reinterpreting and reinstalling the collection, which opens to the public this November. So uh, through this series, we aim to bring international collections uh, and scholars together to discuss modern and contemporary Indian art in order to reassess art, art historical categorizations in uh, current context. So uh, last week was our first talk. So in that talk, we spoke about collections that were built in the post-independence period, uh, featuring the Hurwitz collection, the Nicholson collection, and the TIFR collection. We explore these uh, uh, collections through stories that come through uh, from looking at artworks in the collection. Also, uh, the art ecosystems of the time, the relationship between collectors and artists, and also through uh, some of the unexpected finds within the collection that sometimes tell a, a very different story from uh, dominant narratives in art history. So uh, with that, I've come to, the, to today's session. And today's session is titled, uh, Who, Man, and Myth, Woman and Myth, or Man and Myth, in which we explore mythology or myth-making in modern and contemporary Indian art. So historically, uh, visual representations of mythology have performed um, a religious function where they are envisioned as an embodiment of uh, the divine imagined from religious texts. So these are uh, illustrative of facets of religion from prehistory to con the contemporary and their manifestations in architecture, sculpture, and paintings. Uh, but within the purview of modern and contemporary art, artists have referenced myth in their works, drawing from his the historical language of art as also marked by individual idioms. Uh, the usage and reference to myth in modern and contemporary uh, art is to engage with pre-existing stories that are rooted in the rel religious, traditional, and spiritual belief systems. In that sense, this usage engages a, a prior knowledge of something that precedes the work. For these reasons, the allusion to myth in artworks becomes um, a, a rich source of making meaning um, that speak to current concerns. This interface uh, of a past knowledge uh, reinterpreted in the present is a way to uh, speak about the present which engages notions of tradition, modernity, and public belief. So all three of our presentations today will look at the idea of myth in art through different frameworks combining art historical, social, and uh, political perspectives. Uh, the way that these talks are structured is that each of us will present for about 15 minutes, followed by a discussion and question answers, uh, question answer session with the audience. 
So I encourage you to uh, keep your questions or comments ready, uh, if any, towards the end of the uh, third presentation. Um, so um, we're going to start with the presentations and I am scheduled to go first. So you'll have to bear with me for some more time. I'm just going to do a screen share. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay, okay, great. Okay. Um, so today's session is titled Woman and Myth or Man and Myth, in which we explore mythology or myth making in contemporary Indian art. Uh, so in my presentation, I've explored the idea of place and the everyday in myth making. I'm going to discuss uh, artists' works from the late 1960s to, the, to, to 2000, mainly from Baroda and Bombay. Uh, through this presentation, I will also uh, examine the art historical categories of the so-called abstract and the narrative. Uh, these are categories that have come to be associated through art history as two uh, dialectically opposing ways of uh, art making, where art practice in Bombay was associated with the abstract and the figurative or narrative with Baroda. So I have explored artworks uh, in, in this presentation that push these boundaries or make us uh, look at new ways of thinking about these categories. Uh, also within an artist's practice, there are different time periods uh, and different referential points. So it may be worthwhile to kind of go into that and, and look at it for a more holistic kind of understanding. Uh, so here, the first slide I have is uh, Nalini Malani, this painting. Um, so all, all, the, all the presentation I should mention are um, kind of very visual with uh, artworks from different collections. And in my presentation, the artworks are, of course, from the JNF collection. And wherever they are not, I have mentioned that in the slide. So I'm starting with this, uh, this work by Nalini Malani, which is titled She, He. And um, I want to start with the idea of myth making as storytelling. So if myths can be described as fictitious stories uh, that usually have a larger lesson or a moral, it's interesting to see the way that uh, these are used in contemporary art to speak about larger um, sort of current social concerns. So in this we have Nalini Malani has referred to uh, a story from the Mahabharat of Urvashi and Arjun, where Urvashi is a apsara or a nymph and she has cursed Arjun because he refuses her advances. Uh, so he has, she has cursed Arjun that he's going to be the, uh, a eunuch for the rest of his life and he can only sing and dance uh, with, uh, with women. Uh, so, uh, you know, so here you have the reference to mythology, um, but also like to address a very real sort of, uh, uh, you know, gender inclusivity in current times. And Nalini herself says that it was when she was kind of thinking about a transgender friend. So uh, to go a little bit into the story and indulge the uh, storytelling and myth making, uh, this story is actually quite rich in terms of, uh, of what all it addresses. So Arjun is in exile with the Pandavs um, and they, these are the two warring sides, the Pandavs and the Kauravs. And uh, he, he is actually collecting weapons for the war. And he's collected all the weapons and then Indra tells him that he needs to still collect the Gandharva Astra. And the Gandharva Astra is the weapon of art of, um, 
dancing and singing. And so Arjun says that I, 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 what, what use is this going to be? And uh, then Indra tells him that actually art is the, uh, the most powerful weapon. So he agrees to uh, do that and Urvashi is actually his teacher. And that's how she kind of falls in love with him and uh, you know, makes advances which are reputed and then he, he gets cursed. So just uh, to go into that. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, this is another work by Nalini Malani. It's a, it's a, a, a work from a previous period. And here I actually want to speak about the idea of uh, place and the everyday. Uh, this is a work when Nalini Malani was, had a studio at Lohar Chol, which is kind of like an overcrowded middle class neighborhood uh, where the public and the private interface in a way that uh, uh, private lives, uh, it's kind of like a ghettoized area where private lives are completely on display because there is that uh, whole urban and, and some kind of um, uh, mixing that happens. So uh, here she she kind of looks at the idea of family and like in, in middle class neighborhood, like middle class family and the idea uh, and the relationship between family members. And here you can see, I'm just gonna try and point. Um, so the little girl in the family becomes the witness to a patriarchal system. So she's still too young to kind of uh, be effective or have a voice in the family, but uh, so she, she's kind of turned away and looking at this. So it's really to uh, speak about uh, the idea of place and the local in kind of making a larger story or a narrative. Um, this work is by, of course, by Bhupin Kakkar called Around the Temple. Uh, it's a fascinating work because it's it's actually, uh, it's showing the uh, play, again, the idea of the local uh, and place in, in, in telling a story, but it's actually uh, located this at the site of a temple or just outside the temple. And uh, here we see uh, a concern that I feel like is, is prevalent in a lot of the Baroda artists where uh, the local and the like lived everyday experience becomes such a part of, um, of telling a larger reality. So uh, actually at temples, this is, this, is, this is what actually happens. They become a site of congregation for um, all kinds of things and all kinds of people to come together, the whole commerce around uh, the temple as well as communities, people, beggars, there's someone like defecating here. Uh, there's, you know, people playing, kids playing, all kinds of things happening. So it really, what he has uh, depicted in, in a way is a kind of uh, mixing of the sacred and the profane. Uh, and I find it, and that's quite like interesting to see in this work. Um, again, this is Bupin Kakar and uh, this work is called, they loved each other so much that they wore a suit of the same design. And Bupin, as we all know, is of course, uh, he came out very strongly as um, uh, a gay uh, artist and depicted this in his work very boldly. So again, it becomes something that's very mundane and everyday, uh, personal, mundane, everyday, but then it, it uh, kind of addresses a larger social reality and, uh, and larger politics around that. Um, I've not titled this work because I want to ask the question that, you know, I want to come to the idea of the abstract and the narrative. And I want to ask the question that is, is this, would this be read as an abstract work or, or, or something that is representational? And I'm going to come in a second to the, um, to what the details of the work. So this is Nalini Malani's work, which is titled When Krishna Opened His Mouth to Speak. So uh, within mythology, I mean, we know the story about when Krishna opens, uh, like the child Krishna opens his mouth to speak, his mother sees the whole world in his mouth. And 
uh, so just the idea of myth and how it's used like um, you know when you see this work it maybe looks abstract but when you kind of see the reference for it like when you kind of see, hear the title for it um, you start to then see things in it Uh, this is again another work by, this is a work by Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh. And uh, again, um, to reference the idea of Baroda as narrative, but uh, like I said, I want to explore works that sort of push these boundaries. And uh, again, this is a work that is, uh, you know, it's got all these colors and the way that it is laid out could easily be read as that kind of interface between like a narrative and an abstract work. This, this is also work from the 1990s when um, Ghulam Sheikh had, was um, kind of representing more uh, ascetics and uh, Sufism in his work. And you can maybe um, look at that as landscape, uh, like a mountainous landscape and maybe you know, that kind of aesthetic style. Um, again, another work from our collection uh, called The Incomprehensible Animal. Uh, and I remember something that uh, uh, Ghulam Sheikh had once mentioned that in, in the, um, like when you're representing something fictitious, especially in the representational or uh, representation of the demon or the other, um, there is there is this othering that takes place. Sorry, uh, othering that takes place where you refer to uh, two things that are not uh, that you imagine are not part of yourself. And uh, of course, here this is like a composite sort of um, animal where you have like a mix of uh, all kinds of you know, like references of a, of a peacock, maybe an elephant leg and a horse leg and, and the color around it. Um, this is, again, I'm coming back. So I'm going to go back and forth with a few works. This is Nalini Malani again. And again, I, I, I want to look at the, uh, the formal sort of usage of myth and between abstract and, and reality. So uh, again, this is something that you have all these um, the colors and kind of like a very abstract look to it, but then you have these figures and you have things that are rooted in, in reference and then the whole thing starts to kind of um, fit together in a larger narrative. Um, this is Akbar Padamsi's work from 71. And here we have something that again uh, is kind of between uh, abstraction and figuration. So when you look at this work, you, you just see maybe patches of color, you see all that. And then you slowly, uh, you can make out a face and you can then make out uh, the figure as well. And Akbar Padamsi, uh, I think maybe at this point, there were lots of works that he did and uh, um, after this period also, which were his metascapes, which kind of uh, blended the idea of uh, the metaphysical and spiritual within his depiction of uh, natural life. And they sort of became more um, to do with uh, internal sort of process. And also Nalini Malani. Now this is again to speak about the different time periods in an artist's life and uh, just how kind of uh, similar in a way it is. Again, this, uh, these are both works from the collection and we have a Gaitonde work who, uh, as we know, was kind of part of the periphery of the Bombay progressives. And um, of course, a very strong force in abstraction in Bombay. And uh, here we have Nalini Malani, again, a very kind of uh, a work that may not have been seen or a part of uh, her practice that may not be known so much, but you kind of see the sort of uh, similarities and also the kind of references that uh, artists go through. 
different fields. Um, and you cannot you cannot speak about abstraction without now including uh, Nasreen Mohammadi, who um, actually uh, who passed away in ninety one, and uh, it's only after her death very recently in uh, between like early two thousands that she really uh, got recognized and suddenly got picked up as a very important. Uh, kind of force in, when you view modern art history as some as someone who was working with abstraction uh, while surrounded because she was also teaching in Baroda and she had a very strong link with Baroda to uh, uh, sort of um, you know really going in a way against and working with abstraction while surrounded by a very strong narrative tradition. But I want to actually look at some of also, and this is of course well documented now because Nasreen has had, there, there are many retrospective shows around the world that have been uh, now organized of Nasreen. Um, so I want to go into some of the photographs and again the idea of the local uh, in her work. So uh, here we have photographs that were taken by Nasreen and uh, you know i find it very interesting that um, if you look at this photograph it's actually a city and uh, there's also like a car and a road so you can make out some other kind of city life uh, this is of course a sunset and it kind of uh, has an interesting op opposing kind of contrast to it but also the way that uh, in nasreen's work this uh, the city, the architecture, the place, uh, the environment, the landscape, all sort of come together, um, kind of pared down to lines and, you know, uh, to find, I, I, uh, to my mind, a kind of almost like a sacred geometry of her own making where everything sort of fits together, light, shade, the mess of the city, everything is kind of pared down to this kind of uh, a minimalist thing where there is it's almost like expo exploring like an order of things in, uh, in some way these are again um, uh, photographs by Nasreen which were uh, taken in the Middle East this is from Kuwait of a water tank and this so like a strong reference uh, to place and uh, to the experience of light shade and, and the way uh, things are Um, yeah, I'm, go I'm going to end uh, soon. This uh, coming back to the Bombay, uh, you know, artists who were associated with the Bombay progressives. And this is Krishan Khanna's work, um, Christ at Emmaus, where, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of Krishan Khanna said in many interviews and it's written everywhere that he, um, w when he was uh, making these, um, like he's done a whole series of he's, many times he goes back to biblical references and when he was doing that he um, uh, he was actually in Nizamuddin in Delhi and uh, he would notice these pilgrims who would come and to, to his mind they looked very much like something of, that of Christ and, and uh, people in the Bible so uh, again again the reference to uh, the local and, uh, you know, kind of inspired from there. So in Krishna Khanna's work, he brings uh, that experience to depicting a, a, a bibli uh, biblical theme uh, or a biblical moment. But in his work also, it's to tell of a larger kind of uh, social reality. Um, and I will end on this slide, which is Krishna Khanna, The Last Sermon in the Battlefield, which is also our title image for uh, this series. And um, I mean, this is a fascinating image in, in, in many respects. Uh, a, in the sense that it is, of course, uh, the, a scene, uh, again, from the Mahabharat, which features Bhishma Pitama. Uh, who is the patriarch of the Kauravs and the Pandavas, both warring sides. And in reality, he is, of course, uh, 
he is closer and he has a lot of love for the he's more on the side of the pandavas but in in the war he is on the side of uh, uh, the kauravas and uh, he gets shot down by arrows from uh, the uh, pandavas and in his this dying state in a state of suspension because he has the power to decide when he dies so he apparently lives on for almost 58 days in that state uh, giving advice and sermons you know life advice and sermons to um, to the pandavas and it's just the the whole moment that is so uh, has all these beautiful like contradictions moral contradictions the way that it's painted it's it's no longer it's it's not depicted as a as a kind of godly uh, figure the godliness is kind of gone out of it and it really looks like it could be a scene from an actual war in the earlier times uh, you see these people in black in armor while he's this white kind of figure uh, they are you know they are all vertical he's in this horizontal space so um, i have just uh, to end there because i think we should keep the time and uh, yeah and i'll end here so i'm going to now ask zehra to present Sarah? I'm trying to uh, share screen and not doing very well with it. Um, am, am I sharing? Can, can, can you all see? Uh, yes, we can see. There are. That, that's great. Thanks, Pooja. So just to follow on from, uh, you know, uh, what Pooja said about the sort of theme of, of this session, which is very much sort of relating ideas of myth to the artworks that we're looking at, but also, um, you know, re relating ideas of myth to concepts of sexuality. Um, and in, um, in both my case and in uh, Siddharth, who will speak after me, um, you know, we're also kind of interested in ideas of um, uh, censorship, uh, the secular, um, and just as a little warning, um, you know, I hope nobody's offended by the things that I have to say. And so I definitely come in pink and peace. Um, and um, so some of, some of what I really want to discuss um, in this presentation, and I'll give you three different and separate examples, um, is really about the way in which um, woman, um, the figure, the, the female figure, um, is used in three in the work of three separate artists from slightly different time periods uh, to talk about the concept of the Indian secular and how that is actually constructed. Um, and some of the images that we'll be discussing are ones that can be, you know, can have multiple interpretations um, and uh, they have had multiple interpretations. And this is very much an argument about the nature of the Indian secular and the way in which um, this particular kind of secularism that comes out um, uh, through art um, is both uh, changing, adaptive, uh, but also very much um, kind of on the cutting edge of a particular sort of problematics um, that we are seeing today with the with the rise of um, the right, let's call it. Um, and so the three people I want to talk to you about, one is M.F. Hussain, um, the other one is Bhupin Kakar, and the third one will be Nalini Malani. And in each case, we will look at the figure of um, the female form um, and the way in which it is used within the construction of the secular and some of the sort of uh, problems that it also runs into. 
Um, so, of course, Hussein, um, and I've often talked about Hussein in the context of uh, man, the, the amazing work that uh, Peabody Essex has its in, in its collection. But today, I'm not talking about him in the context of man so much as in the context of a uh, woman. So here we have, um, you know, Hussein's sort of weddedness to the idea of um, uh, the beautiful Indian woman, uh, the mother goddess, um, and the sort of the screen goddess who is both secular, um, a secret, and uh, potentially a figure of uh, lust. Anyway, so um, I'm going to take you through a few uh, images of uh, Hussein in the way he handles the female form. And also some of the rather negative things that one could say about them. Um, and uh, well, leave you to decide for yourself. So um, part of what I'm trying to argue here is that uh, whatever we say about Hussein uh, coming, you know, uh, uh, getting into trouble with uh, certain factions of the right and having to leave India because of this and because of his depictions of Mother India um, on the map of the nation. I just want to point out to you that actually this idea of conflating the, 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 the figure of the goddess um, and potentially the mother goddess with um, the map of uh, the nation and also with the idea of a sacred uh, India is a really, really long tradition. So the issue is actually how he does this. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'll come to that slowly. Um, so just to, just to quote Gayatri uh, Sinha, um, who sort of uh, picks up on this issue when she talks about the fact that, you know, in um, all the way from the Puranas in the 12th century, you have the description of the goddess. And this actually accords the goddess uh, to the earth itself as a kind of primal uh, identity. And of course, you know, um, in a post-colonial context, um, one is always suspicious of words like primal and uh, identity as a primal, fixed, authentic thing. But this isn't really what I want to talk about over here. What I do want to uh, ad address is this notion of uh, divinity, um, goddess, and uh, the sort of the idea of India as a as a sort of synergy. And this is precisely what I'm arguing that Hussein draws on to construct his version of uh, a secular Indian identity. Um, and I just want to point out to you a few things. So this Mahabali over here is one that um, I used in the Asia Society show. Um, and it actually comes from the Peabody Essex collection. Uh, so I thought it would be a good plan to have it over here. Um, and you can also see the, the two Mahabali. So this is in a private collection. Um, and they are obviously sort of, you know, uh, chips of the same uh, motif. And I want to point out uh, two of the things that I had referenced last week, which is that Hussein's um, work often uh, kind of draws on, um, on um, Hindu myth and on, um, you know, Indian painterly traditions. And here, I just want to sort of point out to you that the traditions in this case are very specifically, um, we are looking at ideas of uh, Devi, uh, the goddess, um, and the mother goddess, so uh, the goddess Gauri. And this is a 10th century sculpture. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit about uh, some of these affiliations. So the Indian mother goddess is more than 5,000 years old, and there's a continuous tradition of imaging and, wor and worshipping the goddess as mother, though there are many diversities in form and material. So in Hindu Puranic thought, as we know, the land is possessed by a divinity, usually a goddess, and is a, and is a manifestation that coheres to her body. So please pay attention to the word body. The description of the goddess accords to her the earth itself as primal identity. So Parvati is a Hindu goddess of love, beauty, purity, fertility, devotion, divan, power, and she often exists as the mother, god mother goddess in Hinduism and has many attributes and aspects, as we know. Um, 
also within uh, the sort of the, the concept of Parvati is very often, and so if you look at this sort of half, um, you know, this sort of uh, slicing that happens in many of Hussein's paintings. And I think uh, last week I sort of suggested that some of the slight slicings that happen in the 70s are very much uh, slicings that kind of reference um, the, the second partition of the subcontinent. But over here, um, I think the sort of slicing could also be um, so this is a word I have some trouble pronouncing um, the idea of Arda. Uh, Narishwara, which is, of course, um, in Indian art, this vision of an ideal couple derived from Shiva and Parvati, um, with the notion of uh, a sort of uh, a double um, and the sort of the 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 fusion of uh, the male and female forces in that way. So the half goddess, um, the half figure, um, and so. Part of what I'm trying to do here is to can, is, is to show you uh, the sort of the backdrop to to the Hussein's use of this kind of iconography and why am I pointing this out? Well, I will. It's very obvious, and I will show you very shortly. But right now, I just wanted to show you this work. Okay, in my sort of build up, and this is um, obviously Padmini, Mohini, Shakini. Um, so the three goddesses, and what do we know about this work? So it is an example of a theme Hussein would paint throughout his career with his enduring interest in Indian mythologies and women. The composition hones on three iconic female figures, so it sort of uh, pivots around them, who represent the triad of ideals for Indian women in ancient texts. So Padvani, she who sits on the lotus, referring to the goddess Lakshmi, Mohini, the essence of beauty and a female emanation of the god Vishnu, and Shakini, powerful, representing the goddess Parvati. So Hussein's stylistic palette and colors, the work also coincides with a parallel Greek mythological notion of the three graces. And this idea of the Tribanga pose, the, the three, um, uh, is, 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 you know, uh, something that also comes from Indian dance and classical Indian sculpture. Um, and, you know, the, the, the figure of the three often appears, the three women, often appears in Hussein's most iconic work. So here you see the little stamp made out of the painting between the spider and the lamp, which we all know. Um, and what I kind of wanted to point out um, is it, of course, uh, Hussein is sort of obsessed with the idea of the Indian woman, as we will see more of, and he even talks about the way an Indian woman walks in the village, and he says, look at the three breaks from the feet, hips, and shoulder, they move in rhythm. Now, you might find all of this a little bit misogynistic, I certainly do, but that actually isn't really um, the point, I'm going to argue. And here you have, um, we're getting slowly towards the more contentious material, Hussein's use of uh, Indira Gandhi as uh, the Mother India figure. Yeah, uh, And she's very ba barely clad over here, but this doesn't really get him into trouble. So it's much later that he gets into trouble. Um, and over here, he, fa he falls in love with um, Madhuri Dixit and starts portraying her in this sort of... Um, uh, in in um, in a series of of films, um, but I just want to point out that both the sacred um, and the profane coalesce in terms of the way in which um, Hussein presents the Indian woman and uh, the body of the goddess um, becomes fused with ideas of a secular, i.e. plural, um, conception of the Hindu state, uh, of, of the Indian state, um, which then runs a full steam into problems. Um, uh, so here you've got a potentially problem painting, but it's actually not because I've chosen a version that is completely covered up. Um, but we all know the 2005 one that got him into uh, extreme problems and finally he had to leave. Um, uh, and the reason I'm bringing this up really is, uh, is because, and the, and the way I set this up is the fact that um, 
you know, the, the, the notion of India goddess secular was very much part of the vocabulary of the modern that Hussein was creating. Um, and, you know, however we look at that in today's uh, terms as to its potential, mis you know, misogyny, um, uh, one should also see that it was very much of its time. And so when Hussein gets into trouble, um, my argument would be it's not because he is portraying, um, uh, you know, India as a mother goddess, uh, you know, the, the um, sort of the body of the goddess uh, clinging to a map in this way, um, because that's been done a lot before and it's integral to his own aesthetic. It's just that the way in which he does it has suddenly by the 90s and early 2000s um, come into complete conflict with the way in which um, popular, um, the, this iconography um, is used by um, the right. And as far as the right is concerned, you know, it's very much a, a kind of macho uh, Ram aesthetic um, who protects um, a mother India, and you can see her over here, um, again, mapped to the nation as here, but demure, uh, fair, fully clothed and preferably in, uh, in the right terms, wearing saffron. So what I'm trying to say is um, not that Hussein is doing anything uh, different in the iconography, but that what he's doing that, uh, that and, and the crux of really the problem is the fact that he's using the same imagery, but in a form that um, is no longer acceptable to certain factions. Um, and I just want to give you a quote by Arabindo Ghosh from 1905. And if you look at Hussein's uh, map, um, one could almost say that that Hussein map um, is exactly this, right? So do you see this map? It is not a map, but the portrait of Bharat Mata, its cities, mountains, rivers, and jungles form her physical body. All her children are her nerves, large and small. Concentrate on Bharat as a living mother. Worship her with ninefold bhakti. So like this. But of course, with the right, and I'm quoting Arabinda Ghosh, who is uh, often quoted by the right, um, she can be all of these things, but the ninefold bhakti must also be draped nicely in a sari and completely covered up. So um, we know that Hussein gets into trouble. And I'm now moving on to the second version of the, of, of the secular, a kind of revamped secular that also uses the, uh, the female form, um, but in a rather strange way. And so um, with the boop and kakar, who is very much part of the Baroda school. He is also very much part of um, what Gita Kapoor has called the re revamped secularism of the 80s. And I want to show you how uh, Bupin II is highly subversive in the way he uses sexuality and is also equally um, uh, sort of a, a problem character if one actually uh, analyzes um, the way his construction of um, uh, uh, sexual identity um, and also religious uh, iconography goes against uh, the green of um, uh, the right, right? It's providing a very different kind of narrative to what we see. So over here, of course, we've got two men in Benares. It is one of the three paintings uh, together with Yayati um, and um, uh, You Can't Please All that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, announcements of uh, Bupin's coming out as a gay man, um, and uh, what I what I what I particularly enjoy about these works, in which I want to sort of point out to you, is that um, what's interesting about Bupin uh, Kakar's sort of images of you know uh, gay gay men is that and their uh, sort of the way the sexual sort of uh, intersects with the secret is that very often um, what's so subversive is the fact that um, Bupin Kakar will use images 
that um, are very conventional looking. So, you know, yagna, a marriage ceremony, very traditional rituals. And then if you look closely, there's nothing traditional about them because it's not a heterosexual couple getting married. Um, you know, the, the representations, um, here you have a sort of, um, you know, it, it, it's quite obvious um, that what is actually being discussed is homosexuality. And so you have these kind of very conventional, seemingly conventional scenes um, of, of ritual that are actually not conventional at all. Um, and this is where the sort of subversion really comes in. Um, so obviously uh, in, in things like this, you can see them, uh, see it very clearly. Um, and if you look back, this image is not very good. Um, okay. I wanted to point out to you over here that you actually, you know, not only is this is 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 this very obviously erotic, but you also see the Shiva Lingam being worshipped here. So it's this continuous sort of uh, intersection between the sacred um, and the sexual that is going on um, in Bupin's work. And this is where uh, we can get uh, where where the whole idea of woman comes in, um, and also the whole idea, perhaps um, all over again, of this sort of uh, you know uh, of a fusion between uh, man and woman in a particular way. And what I'm arguing. This is um, a, a deliberately kitsch uh, painting of uh, uh, well print actually, of uh, Radha and Krishna, is that um, if we look at Bhupin's paintings, um, very often you have Radha Krishna uh, type themes. So, you know, if the right is very obsessed with um, uh, Lord Ram as the warrior god, um, uh, the the sort of the, the more sort of bhakti-esque uh, version of um, you know, Vaishnav tradition that Bhupan Kakar is drawing on is invariably the god of love, uh, Krishna. Um, however, uh, what I will argue is so contentious and subversive in what he's doing is that not just is he portraying um, uh, ra rather Krishna dynamics, but actually very often um, he himself is not in the role of um, uh, of of uh, of Krishna, but here he is in the role of Radha himself. So he assumes the figure um, of um, of the, the female figure, and um, this is really what gets very very uh, subversive. So here I'm going to sort of uh, give you a little bit of the the sort of um, historic history, as it were, with this kind of identification. So the uh, that Narishra, literally the god who is half woman, may perhaps be said to provide one paradigm for looking at Bhupen's work. But in the case of, uh, of, of this work, um, one could almost say that Bhupen's work is not about transcending desire so much as the transcendent properties of desire. Hinduism, of course, does provide paradigms for shifting gender identifications. So um, the Saint Chaitanya dressed as a woman and regarded himself as an avatar of Radha. Other Vaishnavas were likewise urged to identify with Radha, not with Krishna. So, and one of them, a sort of a historic guru, was Ramakrishna Paramhansa, who was a guru of Vivekananda, an important figure in the 19th century Bengali culture. So um, this iconic figure, in becoming a woman, he became neither Kamini nor mother, but the handmaid of God. And this is what gets really interesting. Thus, the transcendence of the heterosexual body made the body itself its vehicle and was manifest in a continuum of corporal gendered signs. Um, and I'm quoting here um, from, uh, I spent many days as a handmaid of God. This is uh, Ramakrishna himself. I dressed myself in women's clothes, put on ornaments, and covered the upper part of my body with a scarf, just like a woman. Otherwise, how would I have kept my wife with me for eight months? Both of us behaved as if we were the handmaids of the Divine Mother. I cannot speak of myself as a man, he said. So his circle identified him with Radha. And here, far from the manly god of war, the Ram, prized by the right, we have 
um, a, a, a Bhupan identifying not, not even with Krishna, but with Radha in this guise. So Bhupan may have referred to a cult where bhakti assumed, um, is, is sort of assumed via this person of impersonation of the female consort. Um, and part of why he kind of gets uh, very much sort of, uh, you know, very much sort of identified with what Gita Kapoor calls a bhakti Sufi secularism is this kind of um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, gender bending um, uh, affiliation or bringing together. And here I just want to give you a little quote about the Bhakti Sufi saints who played a sterling role in spreading the messages of tolerance and love. So the Sufi saints and the Nazars were not only revered by Muslims, but also by devout Hindus. And it's this kind of um, Bhakti Sufi devotion, um, which assumes the, the profane in order to reach the sacred and vice versa. That is a kind of reference point over here. So it's subversive in many levels towards Towards the language of the right, um, because it was also deeply uh, secular and deeply inclusive in, in the kind of dialogue that this is constructing. And then I come to the last, um, my last example of um, a, a, a sort of in, an Indian secularism that creates a counter narrative. Um, and over here, we have Nalini with her work, Twice Upon a Time, which I will come back to. Um, and in the, back, in, in the background, so you can see that. And over here, if so far we've, you know, we've talked about a slightly uh, Hussein, slightly misogynist, uh, ugly way of looking at um, the female form as goddess, screen goddess, or actual, you know, um, uh, mythological goddess religious goddess. Um, and if we've talked about Bupin's impersonations of Radha, as goddess. Um, now we're actually talking about Nalini Malani's use of uh, Sita um, as, you know, in, no, uh, so, so to create her counter narrative, as it were. And so instead of Ram, um, you have things from the perspective of uh, Sita. Um, so this is a rather popular book, and I have taken this from The Wire, The Forest of Enchantment is, is the book. Um, and of course, The Wire in this quote is a little bit obsessed with it. Um, and it says, Sita, daughter of the earth and the arch typical mother listens to the women characters on the margins and shines a loving light on this mythic yet very real world. Um, in actual fact, what I'm, I'm going to be arguing here is that this loving light um, and the sort of arch typical mother um, and daughter of the earth narrative is exactly the, the sort of thing that um, Nalini uses in her work but to a, a much more subversive um, its, uh, effect. And the whole identification of Sita as daughter of the earth is not a sort of primal identity um, in, in, any, in, in, any, in any normal uh, way, um, because it sort of contests um, that affiliation, potentially. Uh, okay. So here you have Nalini Sita Medea. I'm, I'm beginning to wind up here. Um, and I'm giving you the, the sort of affiliation that uh, Nalini makes between Sita and Medea. So two very strong female figures. And both of them are uh, wronged women, arguably. Um, certainly in the case of Medea, uh, uh, certainly in the case of Sita, uh, but potentially also in the case of Medea. Um, so, here I've given you a little quote from um, a, a translation that is uh, very ne nebulous about, uh, you know, Sita sacrificing herself to the earth, as it were. Um, and here, so Sita um, talks. So, so Sita, when the second time she is distrusted by Ram, um, uh, Ram asks Ram uh, whether she can prove herself again. And what does she say? She then stepped away from the large crowd encircling her and said, Mother Earth, if I have been faithful to Rama all this time, take me away home to take me away to my home and hide me. So in fact, it is an act of rebellion um, where she calls upon Mother Earth um, to 
to sort of, uh, you know, justify her claim that she's been faithful all along, but she also returns to the earth. So, Ram, you know, uh, uh, Lord Ram doesn't get her. Um, and um, it's not it's not a it's not a docile portrayal of uh, Sita that is being picked up um, here and uh, equally Medea as the wrong woman um, is 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 also about uh, you know talking about the her dishonoring and so by conflating these two figures they are actually two very powerful women figures who while Sita has often been portrayed as a mother earth sort of uh, you know um, as, as a kind of primal mother uh, docile um, image in Nalini's work that is never the case um, and I just want to like end here a uh, 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 now, um, by talking about the fact that that actually by using the figure of Sita in this way, um, and particularly making references to Ramayana, the Ramayana in this way, um, Nalini is drawing on a very plural tradition of the Ramayana. And as we all know, this is exactly the tradition of the Ramayana that is being uh, stamped out for a very, uh, for a rather puritanical version um, of a very sort of macho uh, dominant Ram um, at the moment. Um, and I just kind of want to end uh, with, uh, with the idea and the suggestion that in fact, the sort of the way in which Nalini uses Sita, and here again, you have her appearing in 11, in this 11 panel painting, um, and she's uh, you know, often uh, uh, nude, very ungainly, mutilated. Um, and I, I want to leave it open to you that in fact, this kind of uh, a portrayal, while it is a contesting of the official narrative, is also one that perhaps uh, talks about the fact that um, maybe we are living in, in, a, in a time where this, this sort of uh, usage of mythology um, has limited traction um, with the way in which um, uh, the Indian political climate is going. Um, and that, you know, if, if perhaps one could say that everything that I've argued so far shows that what we have is a particular kind of secularism that is very dependent on Hindu mythology. Um, and my point is that both the left and the right, both the liberal, the secular, as well as the right, use certain icons, then who is to say which is the right way to use them? And in some ways, perhaps, you know, here you can see the two Ramayanas, and this one is meant to be released. And you can immediately see that, you know, the Sita here is, uh, again, um, totally covered up in, in, in a way that is in line with with the current political climate. Um, and my issue is that, uh, you know, um, if, if, if Hindu mythology and if the, if the figure of the mother and um, has been used across the spectrum, then perhaps we're in a slightly precarious place right now um, as as, as or perhaps the secular brigade is in a pretty uh, um, uh, sensitive place right now. And I wonder if in fact, it is this particular um, uh, crisis point that Nalini is actually pointing out in her, in her use of Sita, um, that perhaps Mother India is not a salvation in the way that Hussein thought it was, but rather she really focuses our, our crisis points in the Indian secular. And um, I'm ending here. I can see that. Um. <laughs> Hi, I'm here. Um, thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Pooja, also for organizing this. And good morning, America. Good afternoon, Europe. Good evening, South Asia. I am, um, I'm not going to share my screen just yet. Um, <clears throat> 
I don't like to start things off with an apology. It's actually one of my pet peeves when people begin a talk with an apology, but I actually have to, in this moment, um, uh, explain something. I have recently uh, been given an expanded role at the museum. Um, in addition to being the curator of South Asian art, I've also been appointed the director of education and civic engagement. So for the past three weeks, I've been adjusting to having three jobs. Um, and what that means is that in terms of the presentation you're going to see, I was not actually able to secure permissions for a number of works, which are at the Peabody Essex Museum. Even as a curator, I have to get permission to use works. I wasn't able to get some in time. Um, and the other is that a number of images don't even have captions on them, which is just such a faux pas in a presentation like this. Um, just know that I'm happy to provide people with, with specific information. And there's maybe a benefit to it, which is that uh, we won't be distracted by some of that information and can really just focus on the images themselves. Um, <clears throat> now, I am going to kind of take off from Zara's statement of who's to say which is the right way to use myth. And I would add to that, who is to say that there is only one way to use myth? Um, and I speak to you uh, as someone who has long had an interest in religious art. I think a lot of this comes from having been raised in a devotional Hindu family. Uh, my mother does puja religiously, liter literally, um, every day. I do as well every day. It is a part of my daily practice. And I enjoy seeing images of the sacred in all its many forms. Growing up uh, just outside Chicago, my mother felt that anywhere we stood in the house that that person should be able to see God and that God should be able to see you. And that was certainly not limited to only the Hindu tradition. We had um, representatives from all different uh, religious traditions around the world. And I can remember being in Baroda as a child and watching my grandmother see Mother Teresa come on television and bow to her as if Mother Teresa herself was a goddess. Um, so I'm grateful for this pluralistic relationship with religion that I have as someone who is identifies as a man of faith and as a Hindu. Um, so I'm going to be speaking uh, in defense of some of the work that has been deemed controversial and offensive. I'm going to now share my screen and start um, by saying that when I was in college, let's see, okay, I imagine you can all see this. When I went to college, I went to Johns Hopkins University. Um, there was no Indian art available there. So I studied classical Greek art, Gothic art and architecture, and French neoclassical and academic painting. Um, and these were all essentially about religion and mythology. So if I could not do um, Indian art formally, this was a way that I could kind of um, think about it or approach it peripherally. And the, the thing is, is the the either the fine line or the very blurry boundary between those two words, religion and mythology. Now we can talk about Greek mythology, and I think that we're pretty safe in doing that because the Greek, ancient Greek religion for all intents and purposes is, is not a, a religion that's alive. People are not like actively worshiping Dionysus. Um, whereas in the Hindu tradition, the mythology, the religion is still very much alive. And there are some who are sensitive to the use of the word mythology. And I have used the word the Christian myth and have been called out for that. I think because for some people, mythology presumes that it is not real, um, that it is just stories. My relationship with mythology is whether it's real or not is actually, uh, frankly, it's irrelevant. It's not about... Uh, proving that there is, in the case of Hanuman, like an immortal, invisible monkey uh, somewhere. The truth of that or the not um, is insignificant. It is the power of that archetypal figure, the power of that story, and all the ways in which we can interpret and learn from that lesson. So it was in about 2005 that I began working specifically with Nepalese art. Um, and I was working with Hindu and Buddhist art of the Nawars of the Kathmandu Valley. And here I have um, a detail of a painting. This is probably in real life about two inches in height. And it's a painting of the goddess Indrayani. And so this was more closely related to the traditional forms that the artists in Nepal were doing. But there were also those who were doing more, more modern 
versions. So in oil painting. And oil painting was, I mean, I still find it absolutely remarkable, but this proved to be a little bit more problematic. And it was while working with these artists and learning about this modern tradition that the artist on the left, Uday Charan Shreshta, who's arguably like one of the most important ones of this tradition, told me about a situation he ran into in 1999 when he painted this image of Mahalakshmi. Uh, this is currently, it's in the permanent collection of the Fukuoka Museum of Asian Art in Japan. And there are some iconographical differences between some of the deities between in India and in Nepal. So Mahalakshmi here holds a mirror in one hand and a vessel full of sindur in the other. Uday is really um, committed to his craft. And when doing paintings of deities, he looks at scripture. He really seeks out the correct uh, descriptions of the deities, what they look like, what they're holding, in what hand, etc., etc. So he did a lot of research on this figure and he painted this painting and someone came to his home, uh, an angry person, and uh, wanted to attack him, accusing him of painting Mahalakshmi as a prostitute. And this was in reference to her breasts and to the blouse that she's wearing. Now it doesn't, you don't have to look very far to find images of blouses like this um, in earlier forms of art. And Uday had no intention of doing that. He was actually sticking to tradition, but there was something about her body that someone found offensive. Now, ekphrastic descriptions of feminine beauty, oh, my cat wants to join, sorry. Ekphrastic descriptions of goddesses um, of feminine beauty abound in Sanskrit literature and sacred text, bursting with metaphors that articulate the voluptuous female body as an emblem of fertility. Thighs like ba banana trees or an elephant's trunk arms like young stalks of bamboo, breasts like weighty pots of water that rub against each other rhythmically. Eyes are likened to lotus petals or carp, and eyebrows are gently curved like rainbows or an archer's bow. In the Shakta Pramod, Bhuvaneshwari is described as dazzling like the rising sun with full breasts that are surcharged with milk. And the seventh century poet Saint Sambandar praises Uma, whose breasts are filled with the nectar of the gods. So sensuality in Indian poetry, scripture, and art is undeniable. And for many of us, it is actually a greater source of pride than of shame. So it was around this time, I would say 2006 and 2007, that I started to realize my relationship with my religion was not the same as many others um, had, for whom sensuality and sexuality somehow existed in a realm apart, that it was something debased, deviant, worthy of censorship, or physical assault. Now, I think 2006 and 2007 are really important years, a kind of reckoning. And it was in this moment that I actually started taking an interest or a new interest in MF Hussein. Uh, this was an exhibition curated by Susan Bean at the Peabody Essex Museum. I actually was living in California, never saw it. Uh, but that was my first um, encounter with the Peabody Essex Museum, was contacting the store and requesting the catalog of this exhibition. I had not really been a big fan of Hussein. Uh, I did not like Gajgamini, the film, very much. Um, but this exhibition really, really got me excited because of my love of myth, um, religion, and modern art. And so while Susan was engaging, engaging in this um, really opening up the possibility for looking at Hussein and new conversations around mythology and modern art, in India, during the run of this show, we had Chandra Mohan being arrested in Baroda. So the show uh, at the PBD Essex went on until June 2007, and it was in May 2007 that Chandra Mohan was arrested at the MS University Faculty of Fine Arts in Baroda. We can discuss this particular fiasco later, if you like. But essentially, he was um, arrested for offending religious sentiments for works of art that some people felt um, were inappropriate. Now, I went to Baroda and I, um, where my family is from, and uh, met him shortly after this happened and asked to see some of his work. I did not see the objects that were particularly, you know, deemed problematic, but I saw some other things and I was actually blown away. I thought they were incredibly powerful, um, so well done that he was a real talent and nobody was willing to show 
his work in India at the time. And so my first foray into modern and contemporary Indian art was to curate an exhibition of Chandramohan's work in Thailand. Because if nobody was going to show it in India, I was certainly going to show it in, in Bangkok. Um, and this was a fantastic exhibition. The work was so well appreciated by people. It was almost a complete sellout. Um, I don't know if there were any objects that were left over, uh, mostly acquired by Thai and uh, Western expats living in Bangkok. And it was the following year that I curated an exhibition called Tales of Love and Betrayal, which was a retelling of the, of the Ramayana through the lenses of three different artists. Nirmala Biluka, a Christian artist from Hyderabad, Anand Gadapa, a Brahmin Hindu artist. So Nirmala was painting um, the story of Sita from one perspective. Anand, a Brahmin, was working on Ravan. And then we had Hussein's um, Hanuman series, which he had done with Chester Hurwitz. So we were telling the story without a focus on Rama himself. Um, I don't actually think he appeared in any of these images. And um, it was a great exhibition. Of course, the newspapers in India had a field day with this, with this line, US-based art curator and writer Siddharth Shah will go ahead with a show featuring Hanuman series of the late MF Hussein. As if there was any reason why I would not have gone forward with this exhibition. So this is all to give you a little bit of background of where my interests have been in going from religion to modern art. And now I'm going to talk, moving into Hussein's work, about what I view as a real problem with why people are, are so sensitive to some of these things. And it has to do with the gaze through which they're looking at this work. And it relates to darshan. So I'm kind of, you know, preaching to the choir here by speaking mostly to an Indian audience who will know this. But when talking to Americans, they don't really understand darshan as a central practice um, of, of Hindus. And it's interesting because we don't really have a word for this in English, a kind of transmission through sight between the viewer um, or the devotee and the deity itself. It's a kind of gaze that is religious at its core where the image is viewed as having a kind of uh, blessing potential. In the practice of darshan, it is the face that is of the greatest emphasis, particularly the eyes. So the devotee goes to the temple, looks into the eyes and, and, and experiences some kind of um, mutual gazing and blessing power. In addition to the eyes, emphasis is on the hands and the feet with adornment and ornamentation heightening the bow of the deity or the, the mood and experience or sentiment um, of this darshan. And what happens is, so this is a temple image consecrated, um, embodying the deity itself and intended for darshan. But when there are images produced in India where they're not in temples, these representations also often follow a similar approach or align themselves with this form of seeing, with this particular gaze, where the mythological subject or the religious subject is shown forward facing, full frontal, bright colors and ample ornamentation, big, big eyes, clearly delineated face, hands and feet, all very, very visible. It's a gaze that values the images, not for their innovation, reimagination, or aesthetic, but how effectively the viewer experiences a personal relationship with the divine. It is essentially an icon. The emphasis not on artistic merit, but on the image's perceived potential to bless. And this kind of image is very different from a narrative image. I'm sticking with Narsim here because he's one of my favorites. Um, this is not the same. Narsim is clearly, um, I mean, he's busy. He's not looking at us. He's not just there to give uh, blessings. He's engaged. He's about to tear Hiranyakashipu apart. Um, this is a form of storytelling. Um, the viewer is a witness, a passive witness. Um, and I believe that these images should not be evaluated along the same, through the same gaze. They should not be viewed the same way. Um, the narrative scene is one where we are a witness and the story can be interpreted however we want to. There are various lessons to learn from it. 
The best example of this distinction is perhaps Ravi Varma. So Ravi Varma, his mythological narratives were those that were favored by his colonial patrons, whereas it was the Indian audience that preferred these more iconic representations of a figure looking straight at the viewer with a possibility for and a connection to darshan. And it should be noted, moving into Hussein, that when it comes to Western art, to use mythological or religious scenes that incite contemporary significance has long been considered one of the highest forms of painting. So this is the Oath of the Horatii by Jacques-Louis David as an example. It's from 1783. He did another version in 1786. Important to know that the French Revolution was in 1789. So, this is a painting that really is almost like the Mahabharata. So you have a father giving swords to his three sons who are going to go into battle and fight another family. Uh, but the women on the right are, are broken because one of them is the sister of these three brothers and she's engaged to a man on the opposing side. Another one of the women is the wife of one of these three brothers. So she knows either her husband will die or her brother will die. And this was taking a mythological subject, painting it in a way that reflected on France's own politics and situation of the time. So it's important for us to think about this. And I believe that this would have been well known to artists in India, particularly working within a Western system of, of, of art education and art history. So moving to M.F. Hussein. Um, in addition to being hugely successful and a world-renowned painter, he's also been, um, he's also abundantly enraged people like, like this fellow here, um, who is saying, well, the image opt from Kinsia, but he's speaking about Hussein painting icons, our Hindu icons, which is exactly my point. Hussein is not painting icons. The paintings are not intended for devotional worship. It's a totally different thing he's doing. In 1971, Hussein paints, um, he visualizes the Mahabharata in a series of 29 paintings for the Sao Paulo Biennale. All of these are works in the Peabody Essex collection. Um, and he states specifically that when he's approaching this, he's not interested in the philosophy and the religion here. It was about structure, conveying intensity of the feeling. So for example, the painting on the left, the lower left of Bhishma, this is not a representation of, of Bhishma reciting the Vishnu Sahasranam while he's laying there. This is not the sermon as the image that Puja showed. This is a figure suspended between heaven and earth, life and death, with these bodies intertwined, which I'm not sure whether they are of sexual union, a reference to his vow of celibacy, whether it is figures locked in battle. There are all kinds of ways to interpret this this image here. And that is the Hussein's approach to the Mahabharata series in 1971. It's a represent, a Bhishma also I'll mention is a subject he returns to over and over. He um, opens his series in 1983. He does this series of prints with Chester Hurwitz. He opens with the image of Bhishma. And I'll just go forward one slide. So you see this image on the left is a part of that series on the right. He, um, he does this kind of Happy New Year card for Chester and Davy. But the frontispiece to this Mahabharata series, which ties much more closely to the, to the epic than the 1971 painting, says from C. Rajagopalachari, whose version of the Mahabharata Hussein was reading, the Mahabharata discloses a rich civilization and highly evolved society, which, though of an older world, strangely resembles the India of our time. So he's doing what David is doing in 1783, taking myth to make a statement about his contemporary nation. So the series is essentially an allegory for contemporary India, where the great universal myth is conveyed through universal faceless figures whose struggles are our own. One of the images here, I'm just showing two from this series, are of Ganga and Yamuna. Two rivers, one light, one dark. All of the, all of the elements that would make these figures of um, religious viewing or darshan are gone. We don't have eyes. There's no forward gaze or mutual viewing. 
elaborate jewels, are gone, ornamentation, flowers, their implements, their vehicles, there's no crocodile with Ganga, there's no tortoise with Yamuna. All of these things that would make them iconic are gone, obliterating the traditional relationship between deity and devotee in order to convey something different. They are not goddesses for worship. Yes, honey, Kana. This is not intended to invoke religious sentimentality. They are river nymphs whose bodies materialize out of the rivers only to dissolve back into them. They are the spirits, the essence of the sacred rivers. They are the water themselves. And frankly, in my opinion, you can't put a blouse on water. Um, and we should be lucky that her pudenda is covered in this image. And there is this image of Draupadi with dice, which to me is the most powerful in the series, the scene of her humiliation, Draupadi Vastraharam. This scene is like the climax. I, as a child watching the show, would watch this over and over and over again for that magical scene where Krishna's hand is up and the sari fabric is materializing out of it and Draupadi spinning and spinning and you all know the story. However, Hussein shifts the moment this is not the scene of divine intervention. There is no Lord Krishna here. The emphasis is not on religion. It is on the mistreatment of the female character. Hussein's vision shows us a tormented woman with her unbound hair, literally caught in a game of dice. Her mouth is open as if unleashing a horrific cry. Her gaping mouth resembles the empty mark of marriage on her forehead a sign of her loyalty to men who've implicated her in their own pride, madness, and mess. There is no reference to her husbands or Krishna, her savior. The focus is not on devotion to God and divine intervention. It is on the injustices and immorality that underlie so many aspects of this story. It's about her experience, her trauma. So Hussein's figures are often faceless, missing an arm, a leg, a hand, or foot. I do not read these as dismemberment. Instead, they sever the subject-object relationship of darshan and require a different way of viewing, a different gaze, a broader vision that considers the universal value of these stories and their characters. So this is just reiterating that the subjects of his work should not be reduced to the religious context of a single community, because of the kinds of experiences and new insights that are possible when viewing them through a different lens. And I'll end with this quote by K.G. Subramanian, which I love so much and is so relevant. All faiths, myths, and institutions need to be subjected to critical scrutiny from time to time. To protect them from this is to undervalue their worth. And thank you. Shall we reconvene and take questions? Right, Pooja. <laughs> we can take questions. Um, if anyone has questions, you can put it in the Q&A section. Not coming yet. Um, yeah, I just, I, I love what Siddharth said about that, but that particular relationship between um, darshan and um, uh, modern and contemporary art, where it's just not meant to be doing the same thing. So it's a it's a mislabeling of categories um, to force something to to uh, fulfill a function that's that's not there for it. I also wonder, though, um, you know, whether part of the issue uh, for us is the level at which, um, you know, uh, Indian modern and contemporary art has, because of the whole, um, the whole question of how Indian secularism ought to work, and because such art has often become um, a sort of ideological mouthpiece um, for a plural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious sort of society um, that often, even though, um, you know, 
yes, it's not meant to be looked at as a deity, but we channel the aura of, 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 of deity. And that this is precisely the same thing that um, politics does. Um, and so we've sort of this quotation of the divine for, um, for kind of profane means, as it were, um, is part, part and parcel of, of the kind of the, the justification of um, modern contemporary art. And it is also part and parcel of the justification um, of political narratives. Um, and this is actually the crux of why we have the issues we have. And I wondered if um, Siddharth, you might want to say something to that. Well, I mean, I just think that um, as a human being, limited by my human experience, I am not a one-dimensional person. I know that I am multidimensional. You are too, Pooja. All of us are. Mm -hmm. And I find it like more offensive that people feel that the deities should be viewed from one lens, so that they are somehow one-dimensional. Um, is like, that's more offensive to me than, than like, you know, questioning or, or shifting or reinterpreting. Uh, that's what comes to mind for me. And I've also thought like, if there are gods and goddesses, um, I don't think they need me to protect or defend them. I think they're fine on their own. Like they, 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 will, they will deal with the situation how, how they want. Um, but yeah. I also see all these, yeah, go ahead Pooja, but I also see these questions coming in, so. Yeah. No, I was just, um, I, I, just to respond to that, I was also wondering because it's not like, um, like all art, um, modern and contemporary art, the depictions are not darshan. You know, whether it's in the case of Hussein or Nalini, all of them are kind of speaking to uh, a different current reality, which is then uh, spoken about through building on a narrative that already exists. So it's kind of making meaning, uh, you know, through a story that is already known, but then interpreted in a in a different way. But at the same time, um, like in the case of Hussein and Siddharth, you spoke about, um, you know, Chandra Mohan and, and that incident. And uh, like I've studied in Baroda and I just graduated. We were all there. We were all part of that protest uh, of the arrest. And I think what happens is there's this interface of the public viewing of these artworks that then uh, is interesting because it, it kind of blurs that boundary that, okay, this is, this is not uh, uh, the representation of the deity, but it's trying to say something else. And, you know, and, and it kind of, like, it kind of uh, negates the rich tradition of representation of images, whether there are, you spoke about the mother goddess or representation, which is kind of uh, uh, depicted in so many different ways, could be a very beautiful or violent form. It has the kind of feminine principle of uh, depicted in so many different ways. So I think uh, that's something that maybe we all are addressing in our papers is this narrowing down of mm -hmm. mythology to be, depicted in in one certain way and of course uh, you know i think rulers monarchies governments everywhere it, uh, religion has always been a, a sort of tool of power of wielding power of bringing people uh, together to believe in something so uh, not getting into more of that but maybe because we have a lot of questions uh, uh, do you want to take your question, Pooja? Do you think an artist's religious identity has anything to do with the artistic idiom, especially when it comes to abstraction in maybe Nasri and Muhammad? That's very interesting. Okay. Um, well, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure, but of course, um, you know, even Siddharth mentioned, and all of us have uh, a range of have a cultural experience being part of a society, being part of a family, being part of a larger um, thing. So I feel like maybe not directly, and it I, actually this question, it, it really depends on the individual artist of how they kind of look um, and use those things. So I, I wouldn't 
I, I don't know if it just kind of features in, it depends completely on uh, the sort of self-critical or uh, awareness of how uh, artists use mythology. Um, and I would, also say, I would also yeah. say, Pooja, it's like an artist can be born Muslim, yeah. But if they're not like actively a practicing Muslim that is like very, very engaged in that, then their their religion of birth does not necessarily impact it. I mean, I think of Al Hussein being, you know, such a problem, but Raza not yeah. when he's clearly looking at Hindu, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, so. yeah. yeah, I think, but it's it's actually a very interesting question, Nirmala, because um, while you're studying art and making art, these are kind of questions that really come to you, like look you in the face to uh, define your own identity because these may be things that you've grown up with and you kind of learn to look at it in a different way. So it's definitely, uh, it's a definitely a very interesting question. We can maybe take some more as well. Hmm. Um... I, I, there, there's this very interesting one that talks about uh, would you say mythology is actually history? Um, and I, I mean, I, I, I don't, um, obviously, I don't think any of us would uh, yeah. sort of dispute that mythology is not history, it's but. Not history, uh, but of course, that's a kind of notion that is used. Uh, by many people, uh, I mean, that's used to kind of, um, yeah, like it's used by governments, it's used by people. And I mean, even I remember reading something long, many years ago while I was studying about the uh, ASI digging somewhere for gold because, you know, uh, they uh, some kind of ascetic had a dream. So we are constantly moving between myth and reality, even in the way that we uh, kind of, uh, you know, conduct uh, social operations. So definitely. With that also, I would say like our ability to um, cut out certain aspects of history, like mythology, there's myth making, but there's also history making. I mean, like when I grew up in the United States, we never studied the Vietnam War in school. Um, it just was not covered, just like colonialism is often like not covered very much in depth in England. So that is kind of creating a myth out of history, structuring history uh, mm -hmm. in a certain way, selectively showing history to create a myth of nationhood as well. Yeah, that's, that's very, very interesting. Yes, that's yeah. very good. Yeah, and, and the kind of like, uh, you know, um, I mean, if we come back to the kind of Benedict Anderson idea of an invented tradition that actually is at the root of nationalism, in itself, um, you know, the fact is that national histories are a process of myth making. Um, it's just, it gets very scary when that process of myth making is deliberately as, you know, as exclusive rather as than as inclusive it, as it can be. Um, I don't think one can argue with the fact that 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 history uses myth, but um, I think it also comes with a certain responsibility for people who are in power to use that wisely. Um, there was a question that I'd like to um, address, which was about how do you explain mythology in a limited word count? Um, let me see, it was in the <laughs> chat box. How do we explain myths to an audience in an exhibition while still adhering to a relatively short word count? It seems that it is important to know the actual story before launching into a specific angle. I speak from experience in battles with Western institutions. So I just, I, I wanna address this because I've had to deal with this. I have uh, in the new Hurwitz gallery, um, five of Hussein's Mahabharat paintings. Uh, with a limited word count, how do you take the longest epic in human history and describe it in like 150 words or less? Um, so I have um, had to, there's no one way to deal with that, I would say, but it goes to archetypes. So because the, um, the Mahabharat, like they're all kind of related, there's all these other characters, you can't tell one story without all this backstory. We have to bring it down to the archetypal characters. So there's like 
the teacher and the disciple at the Bhagavad Gita. And I don't go into like the, the sermon that Krishna is giving Arjuna. We just say that this figure is broken and his mentor teaches him and helps him kind of rise to the occasion. It is a deep simplification of things, but I think that it's a case by case basis. And I often don't even use the names of the characters um, because they can't say like Dhritarashtra. I mean, they'll be stumbling over those words just reading them. I have to say like the blind king, things like that. So it is a case by case basis, but come see the gallery when it's open and you can you know, criticize the labels all you want. It was like hellacious having to, to do that. Um, if yeah, I think the audience is something that is quite important. Uh, of course, in a Western context, none of this public interface would even be problematic. So definitely, if you're, if you're doing an exhibition in the US, uh, which may be perceived as contentious here, you know, so definitely, I think context is, is it and audience is, is, is something that's very important. I mean, it's really interesting if you, you know, if you, if you kind of read uh, what Gita Kapoor says about um, Hussein. Well, first of all, uh, she has um, uh, these amazing and lovely quotes, which I was meaning to read out to you, but then I got a bit carried away, uh, sort of castigating what she calls um, his uh, sort of showmanship in, in she, she doesn't use that word, um, but basically she sort of talks about the decline of his style um, and, you know, um, and, and kind of almost blames the popularity of his style and his sort of presentation of Madhuri Dixit um, uh, as, and his sort of selling out aesthetically for in some ways um, being responsible for the kind of problems he gets into. So as his style deteriorates um, and he puts himself increasingly out there in a public space, this is part of what the problem is. Um, so that's one level of her argument, but another level of her argument which relates to this sort of, um, if Hussein wasn't Hin it was Hindu, would there be a different thing? Is that she actually talks about, um, you know, the right to uh, iconophilia, the right to present an icon, um, and she says there's a sort of there's a narrowing down of that right in India, where um, you know a kind of I iconoclasm, a sort of denial of the icon to certain. Um, kinds of people, namely Muslims, in order to paint Hindu iconography has come into play. Um, and this is one of the things that, you know, could, could actually be the fourth line. I mean, to that, I would say that, uh, but in the case of Chandra Mohan, so I think it's basically a political climate. And, uh, you know, I mean, here was a, sh a show that was only for uh, people in in the college, and uh, it 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 was odd that it made the sort of splash and the uh, got the attention that it did. It was really took everyone by surprise. So I think it's it's really to do with uh, the political climate and maybe you know at least in two thousand six that's what that's what happened. So yeah. I'd say also one of the reasons to me that Chandra Mohan's work was potentially challenging is because it does follow all of those things that I said is like an image for Darshan. Yeah. The deities were frontal facing, you know, they're, they're there, like they have iconography. They are, they're kind of in this middle ground where they're looking like icons and yet, and yet he's blurring that, that line. But he's also in one of the images styling himself as a deity. And it kind of goes back to the Padmanabhan painting by Bhupen Kakkar that we used for this, um, for this panel. The idea of um, when is it okay, when is it not okay? And is there a challenge when an artist visualizes him or herself as a deity? Um, does that then kind of start to get really problematic or difficult for people? Um, there's this question that actually said that maybe you can take because it sort of relates to that. Um, when Raja Ravi Varma started on his printing press, the objective was never darshan but access. When Siddharth refers to artworks viewed from the concept of darshan, doesn't it mitigate a lot of old classical Indian works, especially in temples and murals, which were made for the purpose of storytelling and not to be revered? 
Um, yeah, that's great. I'm not trying, I mean, I don't know if it's mitigate. I'm, I'm totally acknowledging like, like in the early Buddhist structures, like Sanchi, obviously there's all of these like narrative panels that are meant for storytelling and education, that these are tools of conversation. And, and especially when the narrative, I mean, this was Vidya Dahidja, one of her things is talking about the complexity of narratives in Indian art. So they are meant to be engaged and interpreted and read in a certain way. It's an integral part of the history of Indian art. I'm distinguishing the two more just to, to point out one of the things I view as a challenge in, in viewing these modern works is that we tend to view them as like images for darshan rather than as potentially narrative. And with Varma's work, I agree it was really about access and I actually love those prints. But what that also did was um, it popularized or it revealed the popularity of images based on their similarity to temple images that are meant for transmission, if that makes sense. So like the, the most popular calendar art images that still sell today are ones where it's the frontal deity rather than, you know, Krishna and a cow and his mother engaging in some activity. That will not be selling as quickly as an image of like Krishna looking at you um, as one example. Another thing I just want to mention quickly is, is a question I've always had is how abstraction with deities is like a problem, but yet Ganesh is like able to be abstracted all the time. You'll see it like just a curve and a leaf. Some kind of major abstraction of Ganesh is, is totally fine, but, but once you start abstracting other deities, it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit more problematic. I just wonder why that is. I've long wondered why. Other than Shiva, of course, like the Shiva Lingam, but then that's, mm. that's, yeah, that in itself. Um, oh, this is another one that is a good Siddharth one. Contemporary t Tibetan art takes on a lot from Buddhist mythology too. Do you feel that it is attacked less politically than art drawing from Hinduism? So when I was working with Nepalese art, I was also um, interfacing and working with several um, kind of contemporary Tibetan artists. And uh, one in particular, Ang Sharon Sherpa, was just kind of starting, he was trained in Tibetan tonka painting, starting to explore more modern work. He was a little nervous about how it would be received. And from what I understand, he did not receive much criticism of it, but my, I have not researched this and I've not touched this material in like about 10 years, is um, Tibet doesn't have nationhood. Like, I, I think that some of the challenge with India is like this attachment to nationhood and mythology and religion, whereas Tibet has lost its sense of nationhood um, by now being a part of China. And I wonder if that's why maybe there's not the same, it's not the same as with India and Hindu um, iconography. Mm -hmm. And, and it was also like, I mean, one of the reasons why I used those quotes that actually came from sort of so much older sources is that, you know, this imagining of the nation as, as this, uh, as Bharat Mata, as, as, as the mother goddess, which Somati Ramaswamy talks about such a lot. Um, but the kind of those sort of sim symbolism um, was so deeply rooted in, in the language of nationalism as well. So, which immediately puts all of these symbols out there to be argued over in a way. Um, and sometimes very illogically so when, when art becomes a sort of uh, a fighting point because you, you know, you cannot look at art in this incredibly literal fashion. Um, but, and this is part of the thing is that, you know, who is doing the looking and, and who is an educated viewer? Um, and what, I guess, you know, to come back to like a topic that we sort of explored at first, who is your public? Um, and do you even really want it to enter um, to have this conversation? Um, and, you know, these are very live questions. Well, one question I have, I don't know if either of you will know or if someone else knows, but when they visualize India as the body of the goddess, mm -hmm. so they're, they're styling it as a goddess, what the relationship with the Shakti Peets is, is because, you know, the Shakti Peets are like goddess pilgrimage sites where parts of the body of Sati have, are said to have fallen. And they're certainly not all in India. So when they're visualizing the image of India as a goddess, are we going into Bangladesh and conquering that because parts of her body are there? Are we yeah. going into Sri Lanka? I've been to Nepal, like where um, 
Guhya Kali is one of the Shakti Pizzas in Nepal. Pakistan has at least one. So how does the body of Bharat Mata correspond with the actual mythological body of the goddess? I mean, this is what is so interesting. It's like Sumiti Ramaswamy actually talks about that as, a, as you know, in the early nationalist images as a kind of claiming, um, you know, with the fact that the body goes everywhere. But what becomes so interesting for me is that, you know, the problem Hussein is the problem Hussein that is also um, used for Kashmir uh, um, relief from the uh, earthquake. So, and if you look at the poster for that, um, it's actually, it's claiming all the territory that like her hair blows into, uh, you know, the, the, the mountains and the Himalayas. So actually the narrative of uh, Hussein's mother goddess is actually the whole lot belongs to India. It's a unified India that completely wipes out, um, you know, Pakistan, uh, Kashmir having any kind of autonomy. So it's really ironic that, you know, this should be a problem for the right because, you know, that, that, that aspect of the narrative is exactly the same. Um, shall we take one more? Last one, I think, and then we should end. Yeah, Pooja, yeah. what do you want to take? Pooja, you take one. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's mostly more of the same. Someone mm -hmm. has asked about, uh, someone had asked about Pushpamala and Atul Dudia. Mm -hmm. have also depicted themselves as gods. Mm. Uh, oh, this one's for you, Siddharth. Which one? Um, Shanti. The Pushpamala one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? That was a problem. Oh, well, I would say... Walk, yeah. I mean, okay, so Chandra Mohan's, like, they both had penises in them. One of them had a lot of them in it. Um, the other had, you know, so it, like Pushpamala styles herself as a goddess, but she's like a Ravi Barma goddess, so she's definitely like covered. Um, and Chandra Mohan's is like, it's, it's sexual. It's not just sensual. It's, it's outrightly sexual. And so I think that that was part of the, the problem of it. Um, Pooja, do you have anything to say about that since you were there? Uh, uh, whether it was sexual, I actually didn't see it as that at all. It was pretty, uh, A, they were woodcuts and uh, very expressionistic, but uh, it was so uh, abstract in the form that it was surprising the way that uh, it got uh, oh. you know, singled out and, and, and what happened. So, so uh, yeah, like I was saying, I think it all just depends on other forces and you know, sometimes outside then rather than what's in the art. I also don't know, like, it, it's amazing that the state or whatever comes in when there's something to be banned or prohibited. And, you know, there's, I mean, it's interesting if there could be a larger dialogue uh, in understanding, you know, this in, in a larger sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that's something that um, in that incident that we did, was uh, all the students uh, sort of got together and brought out um, uh, images of um, art from, um, you know, traditional Indian art from uh, miniatures, from temples, sculptures, Kajarao to say, because here the problem was uh, the depiction of a nude figure or ero eroticism. It wasn't anything else. It wasn't anything to do with religion or whatever. It was kind of that. That was something. So, um, so yeah, so we, we sort of brought out all of these images to say that this is part of, you know, the culture. So are you going to like totally ban uh, uh, Khajrao as a tourist site or, you know, and just to say the richness of tradition. So as are we becoming kind of more conservative as a um, culture, as a people? So it speaks to all of these questions, I think. Yeah. And also maybe the problematics of desire, actually, like, you know, that the, why did Atul, you know, why is the Atul one uh, not something that got into trouble? Because nobody desires an old crone, you know, mm. maybe. Uh, um, uh, uh, which is sad because I think it's know. about visibility, um, you know, more than anything. Sometimes to do, uh, 
with the art it's more visibility because i'm not sure like the audience for art and who's actually looking at it so in hussain's case it's of course very very different and again i think it's it's the climate that speaks to that but uh, i mean yeah it would be uh, interesting to say that uh, contemporary art is being looked at in in this mass way that it's just waiting to you know have people engage with it and uh, have a problem with it but uh, yeah so i think maybe we can end uh, let's end there because we now yeah you did yeah on <laughs> with the days evenings nights <laughs> <laughs> wow. really thank week, you, yeah. thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sadat, Zara, and all of you who have joined us. We had like over a hundred uh, attendees for this talk, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. And thank welcome you. to having you for the next one next Friday, for which the details will be out very soon. See you then. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>